Hi everyone, Lindsay Horvath, your mayor here. Wanted to welcome you to the WeHo Reads series. On behalf of all of my colleagues in the city of West Hollywood, it is our absolute pleasure to welcome you. Um, this is part of our city's arts division's efforts to uh, engage people in the creative arts and the literary arts. Um, we have so much fun programming, whether it's our city's poet laureate, uh, who brings uh, such fantastic work to the city, uh, whether it's the Little Free Library series or even Drag Queen Story Hour, um, we find so many ways uh, to bring the literary arts to our community, to people of all ages in all different ways. Uh, I want to thank our staff for the work that they do to make this possible and uh, for any anyone and everyone who is participating today and through the whole series. Um, we hope that you enjoy today's programming and that you'll continue to engage with WeHo, the creative city, and uh, thanks once again on behalf of the city of West Hollywood. Thank you, Mayor, for that wonderful welcome. My name is Mike Che. I'm the city of West Hollywood's arts coordinator, and I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the city to our 2021 WeHo Reads Literary Series Online. You'll meet our producers, Dare Williams and Amanda Fletcher, in just a moment. And we've got a fantastic season planned for you, including such great authors as Charles Yu, who won the 2020 National Book Award for his book, Interior Chinatown, and Miriam Gerpa, whose book, Mean, was declared by O Magazine, one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. You can find out about all the events at weho.org slash wehoreads, where you can also RSVP to get a reminder before each event. Finally, if you post on social media, which you definitely should, please tag us at WeHo City and at WeHo Arts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and at WeHo Reads on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much, and please enjoy tonight's event. Meha, Oish Koneha, Ikwa Aha, Netwan Yane, Kelly Caballero. Hello, my name is Kelly Caballero. I am Tongva. I'm super happy to be here. Thank you. Um, Tongva are the original people of the Los Angeles Basin, and I'm a singer, songwriter, and poet. And I'm just super grateful to WeHo Reads for having me. And I'm going to share a song with you guys and, you know, just set the mood. All my songs are for my ancestors and for all my relatives residing in Tovangar, now known as Los Angeles, and for everyone else who resides here. Screaming into 
like the sand that slips through your fingers and I burn from the rays of the sun. I wanna let him in, but there be no survivors. My temple's a treacherous one. So rain, 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 fall upon my head and take my dreams out to the sea. Where maybe someone will follow the streams back and find me. Thank you so much for having me. And my name is Kelly Caballero. That was beautiful. Thank you. They all just like clap. This is the part that's so weird. <laughs> thank you. Thank because you. Because it's silent. Much I'm trying to get my camera to turn back on. Oh my God, that was so amazing. Maybe I'm crying. Don't tell your <laughs> friends. Hi, everybody. Welcome to In Your Face, Women Writing Truth. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, she's a Tongva singer, songwriter, performer, and poet whose body of work focuses on highlighting the multifaceted and complex lives of indigenous peoples born and raised in urban settings. And I'm so thrilled that Kelly agreed to perform for us this evening because we believe it is our duty to respect and uphold the historical and contemporary presence of indigenous peoples throughout California especially in the West Hollywood area. We acknowledge that we reside on the historic homeland of dispossessed indigenous peoples. And we recognize the Tongva as the traditional land caretakers of Tobongar, situated in the Los Angeles basin. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples. Thanks so much for that song, Kelly, it was so beautiful. All right, so my name is Amanda Fletcher. And I want to welcome you, like I said, to In Your Face. This is our third event in the 2021 WeHo Reads virtual series, scheduled in March to celebrate Women's History Month and proposed by us because we couldn't think of a better pairing of writers to speak their truths to us than Rhonda Gerard and Miriam Gerba. So thank you, Rhonda and Miriam, for being here. And thank you all for tuning in. And uh, jumping off of uh, Michael's video where Oprah did say that Mean is one of the best LGBTQIA plus books of all time, but she also said that Love is the Next Country is an LGBTQIA plus book that will change the literary landscape in 2021. So there are no slouches on this stage, all right? The mission of the series is to amplify underrepresented voices and writers and stories and to uplift artists who have been significantly affected by the pandemic. As a reminder, the event lineup for WeHo Reads is a compelling mixture of experiences, stories, and conversations. And that means some subjects and events may include explicit language. 
we should be so lucky this evening, my friends. <laughs> Exactly. So a short Q&A will follow discussion. Please drop your questions into the chat uh, on the YouTube page. Say hi to my co-producer, Dare Williams. He's over there in the chat room, like any good 90s kid ought to be. So I'm going to start with Miriam. Miriam Gerba is a writer and artist. She is the author of the true, true crime memoir, Mean, a New York Times editor's choice. Oh, the Oprah magazine ranked Mean as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Publishers Weekly describes Gerba as having a voice like no other. Her essays and criticism have appeared in the Paris Review, Time.com, and The Believer. And she has shown art in galleries, museums, and community centers. And she lives in Long Beach, California with herself. Yo, LBC in the house. <laughs> Brenda, Brenda Girard is the author is the author of the memoir, Love is the Next Country, the novel, A Map of Home, and the collection of stories, Him, Me, Muhammad Ali. She's also a performer who has re recently appeared in Hulu's Rami, as well as the short films, Dot Game and Finjan. Did I pronounce that right, Finjan? Her essays have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Salon, Bitch, Buzzfeed, and elsewhere. And her bio is very long and Mary, uh, Renda has asked me to shorten it because I guess she gets embarrassed by all of those kudos. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the, the conversation over to Miriam and Renda. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Oh my God, Miriam. Renda! <laughs> Hi. I have been looking forward to this. Me I'm too. Excited. Any anytime I get I think like I get to hang out with you, I'm just so happy. You know? Oh. I love you. I and love I love you. this. Is this Thank you. is this a collar, a choker? It's actually a choker. It's a choker. Um, I got it for my lady friend and, um, but I also wear it, but she doesn't oh. wear it. okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Cause it's, um, it's kind of girlish, but there's also a tuxedo quality to it. Exactly. You know it's, I mean? like, it's like femme, but also mask in some ways. Yes. Yeah, very soft mask. That's my, totally. that's my, that's what I like, you know? And it has the little, it has a little ring on it. It does, yeah. <laughs> I'm a recovering daddy. Like I'm that's trying so to, yeah, I'm trying to like bottom more and just generally allow others to care for me more. So mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like this is a good way to transition into that. That's so exciting. Okay, so. I love your haircut. I, you oh, know, thank I you. Too. It looks so good. I, f I feel a little bit like um, that character from Dumb and Dumber, you know, Lloyd Christmas. No. Okay. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> <Love> that. <laughs> he wishes, okay? He fucking wishes. I do that all the time. I see looking back. What? I'm just like, I do that, that all the time. Like, I'll be like, I'll get like a really short curly cut. And when it's like super curly, I'll be like, I look like Jonah Hill. Oh and my I'll God. Like, it's no. hysterical. How long is your hair right now? It's, I mean, I have it in a ponytail. It's not that long. Um, no extensions right now. Just growing it very slowly. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I found a good hairstylist um, who has like the growing hands. Ooh, you know what I mean? Yes. No, yeah. I totally do. I totally do. So yeah. I wanted, I yeah, that. I wanted art hair and I feel like this is the artsiest haircut I've ever it's had. So like funny. I didn't go to art thing. school, but my hair did. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> your hair has a hundred thousand dollar MFA. Totally. You don't loan from CalArts. <laughs> totally. Like that's like, that's <laughs> what's happening on my head. Um, okay. So like, I went ahead and I prepared some questions, so but I also like want for stuff to just go wherever it goes. Yeah, same. So I'm gonna dive in with one of those questions and then we'll play with it and we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, and so when I started reading your book, I was really taken with the um, description of the Egyptian dancer, um, Taya Carioca. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and, and you you describe her in exciting detail. And the and 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 um and your description of her made me hungry for more information about her. So of course I went and I did my own research and I was like marveling at photographs of her and um and your reference to her and your use of her as like a um almost like like a north star kind of guiding you reminded me of your salon essay why i can't stand white belly dancers yes and i was i was wondering if you considered writing about that essay and the responses to it as part of love is the next country um i i like the genre um, that involves writers writing about their past writing. <laughs> I like that sort of meta writing. So I was curious if if doing that um, was something that you considered folding into Love is the Next Country. That's so good. That's great. Yeah, I, I did. I did. Um, first, I kind of had the essay in there, but a more updated version to go with the flow of the book. But then I realized something that I um, told my editor, which is that I really like the idea of my work being like a body of work, not necessarily mm -hmm. just Love is the Next Country, but like Love is the Next Country, my fiction books, and like some of my online work, you know, my online trolling that I've done of white supremacy, mm -hmm. uh, racist, misogynist pieces of shit. So yeah, I feel like it's all just part of this. So it's almost like if you have been following what I've said, then you get this kind of present, you get this kind of gift because you know that I said that and this book kind of builds on that without necessarily mentioning it because I wanted to lead into other more recent controversial things, but that essay did get, it just, I was kind of blown away by how many, I think Roxanne called them like the white belly dancer mafia. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they exist. Like they, totally. they were so pissed. I still get emails, but you know, oddly enough now I'm getting a lot of emails from white dancers saying, you know, I really thought about what you said and I quit doing this one thing. Or I thought about what you said and instead of dressing up to belly dance, I just belly dance. I learned how to belly dance without kind of trying to put on the performance of mm -hmm. Arabness, right? Whether it be through my outfit, my makeup, my name, you know, like people who adopt weird personas. Yeah. yeah. So that's really cool. I mean, that's who I that's who I was trying to reach was just saying, hey guys, like please stop doing this. I can't stand it. Like so many other women I know also can't stand it. Mm -hmm. And um but yeah, I, part of me also kind of wants to create like a, a second edition of this book when the, like when, when the paperback, paperback comes out, I want to expand it. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. of including that. And yeah, thinking more about, I have a friend who, um, she's amazing. She runs a perfume company called Jasmine Sarai. And she made like a little love as an ex country scent for me. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. You have your own scent. It's so good. It smells amazing. And she said she wanted one of the notes to be like musky, like someone who's been dancing, like basically to Haya Karaoke. Yeah. But when you spray it, that's the first note and then it just goes away. So she wanted it to like mimic the way that Tahaya comes into the narrative just for a second to give her blessing and act as a guiding star for the book and then goes away. Like we don't yes. really hear about her again. Um, but she, she kind of is like a flicker. She, yeah. she comes in like a flicker and like she makes a ghostly or like the spiritual exit through the, through the deer, like that, the, the, like she shapes, she shape shifts into that deer. Exactly. And like, I was hoping that what that would do was show how all these different people and places that I visit throughout the book hold her spirit too, you know, mm -hmm. not just hers, but like all of our kind of sexy ancestors, queer ancestors, how they kind of like embody these places and yes. experiences without like maybe being spelled out for the reader. Because I like, 
I like having, I like reading challenging books and I like for my readers to be challenged. So, and I also really like teasing. Like I like for the reader to be like, I want more of that. Why isn't there more of that? And I'm like, go look it up, read about her, watch her movies, you know, like. Yeah. No, I love that. You totally did that. You like, for me as a reader, you succeeded in tantalizing. Like I was very tantalized. I wanted to know more about this person. And I love when writers can do that. I love when a writer's obsessions become your obsessions, (laughs) you know, when what you love and what you cherish then becomes what we love and what we cherish. Like, like that transference that happens through art is like, is, 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 is so rewarding and so exciting. And, and you, you achieved that um, with her. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned that you wanted to imbue the rest of the narrative with her presence without necessarily inserting her into it in this heavy handed way. And so you allowed her to, to sort of hover. Um, and, um, and one of the aspects of the book that um, I also really enthusiastically welcomed is that you wrote a tale about a woman going on a road trip and the story didn't involve cautionary episodes of violence. Like that is so standard in female road narrative stories. Like there, there's something that disrupts the narrative and that forces the, the female traveler to go home or to rethink travel and to rethink her relationship with the world. But you do the opposite. You grow and you, um, you become more connected to journey and to travel. And I was curious um, about whether or not you prepared or researched for the writing of this book by um, taking in um, any road narratives, in particular, like any female road narratives? Yeah, so like my favorite female road narrative is actually, it's an essay by Leslie Marmon Silco and it's called In the Combat Zone. It's funny because you say like, there's no violence. So in the combat zone, Leslie Silco talks about just driving to a pet store to buy her snake a mouse, which I love. I love that she's like, she's like, okay, the snake needs a mouse, I'm out. So as she's driving, she notices someone following her, you know, this man following her, a white man. And she tries to lose him, he, you know, he's not lost. But then she's like, okay, I don't, I don't actually care because I have a fucking gun. And Leslie <laughs> always has a gun. When you walk into Leslie's house, there's a painting of her that someone made holding a gun. And she looks like a fucking goddess. And one of the things about this essay is she makes an argument for women carrying. So um, carrying anything that makes you feel powerful. Um, and at the end of this narrative, you know, she stops the white man stops next to her and kind of looks at her and she turns and she has no fear. She's like, I have no fear in my face. And she reaches over to her glove box, takes her gun out and just kind of puts it in her lap and just kind of looks at him. And he has the fear and he drives away. Yes. So yeah, it's so fucking bad. (laughs) You know, that one, that's my favorite. Um, And then like in terms of road trips, honestly, like, I would love to read more road trip stories. I have read obviously like classic shit, like on the road and travels with Charlie. So like, what do people who have the most privilege in this country and are amazing writers, like what, how do they shape narrative? Um, and I've also like dipped into women's narrative, travel narratives in general. And one of the things that has always annoyed me about like specific, specifically, you know, a book that's about like going on a hike or something, mm-hmm. right? I won't name any names, but like <laughs> the thing that's annoying is for me is is women conquering nature. Oh, women God. kind of, need, but not just that, but like punishing their bodies, mm-hmm. right? In mm-hmm. order to prove something, grieve something, mourn something, mm-hmm. purge something. And for me, 
Like I spent the first 20 years of my life having my body literally punished by abusers. Yeah. So I was like, no, that's, that's why I only exercise doing things that are fun. Mm -hmm. So I swim and I fuck. Um, and I also only like, I, I only hike for fun. I'm never like, oh, this hurts. I should keep going. I'm usually like, oh, this isn't nice. This isn't fun for my body. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write a narrative that was like kind of an anti of that, you know, like to show that my body doesn't need to continuously go through pain. I can just sit in a comfortable car, a Prius. I, I've gotten rid of it since then. And, you know. I remember your Prius. What? I said, I remember your Prius. I, I, I sat with it. you in the Prius. <laughs> it, was really good. it was really good for certain things, for parking and I mean, for uh, love, all that. Um, I didn't get rid of it. It actually got repoed. I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so that was I mean I'd love to I'd love to if you have any suggestions for like road trip narratives by women of color I would love to read them so I mean I typically avoid road trip narratives because they tend to center cis straight white men and they tend to be conquest narratives yes. and I have no interest <laughs> In, con in, in any narrative having to do with spatial conquest and conquest of land. And then like you were mentioning, like um, uh, cis straight white women's stories tend to be of a similar ilk, but then you add that ascetic element to it where um, her relationship to the land has to be one of punishment. Yes. And so typically, yeah. So typically I avoid those two and um and I, I i tend like not to be the market for those and and um and when i was a kid i loved adventure narratives and adventure films and um and like in adulthood i looked back at those at at the at the films and the narratives that i really enjoyed consuming and i wondered why it was that i was so attracted to these stories of like i uh, boys in distress having to take like a boy's hero's journey. And I realized that I wanted to take those journeys, but there were no girls represented in film or in literature taking those journeys. And so I would identify with, um, with boy characters and then just kind of abandoned like that interest in adulthood because like, like you said, I, I, I don't want to, um, I'm not in, into stories of like white men conquering mountains, but um, but when you when you described um the relationship of women to land, and that um that relationship in certain genres, especially through tr in, in like travel writing, how it tends to be a very punishing one, um, uh, that reminded me of like another response that I had to Love Is the Next Country, and and that's that. The book is in some ways a maternal book because you write so much about yourself as a mother and you write about becoming a mother. And um, and you write about your mother and her becoming a mother. And you write about this inverse motherhood where the child births the mother. And I'm... Um, and one of my favorite parts of the narrative um, happens really fleetingly. And you mentioned having had to make a choice at some point between, I think it was like attending an event or doing something with your son and you chose yourself. Yeah. And I was fucking thrilled to read that because women are not celebrated for asserting themselves, especially asserting themselves um, above their children. And women are so frequently like, not just vilified, but demonized for doing that. And I was like, this is the kind of mother's narrative I'm interested in reading. Like I want to read about the mother who puts herself first. Yeah. So, so I found that really thrilling. Like <laughs> when you wrote that, did you have like a sense of defiance or was that something that you noted like in retrospect or, or is it something that you're just noting now as we talk about it? So a lot of the book was written in different segments. And mm -hmm. when I was building it to make it into a book, like a, a full narrative from start to end, 
I was kind of moving towards, moving from kind of describing the ways that my parents abused me um, and the way that my mom, you know, allowed that abuse and therefore also abused me. Um, and then I wanted to slowly move towards understanding and forgiveness. So towards the end, or towards the middle, I kind of start talking about who my mom was and what she went through. And then towards the end, as I'm, you know, coming to a place of forgiveness with her, I'm realized I wanted to show the ways that I, that I supposedly fucked up, that I put myself first. So um, yeah, that's why I place that. I, and I place it towards the end. But like, to me, I also really wanted, like, I am a mother, but I'm an artist mother. Like I'm a mother who's an artist first, which is kind of difficult because everyone who's a mother always says, well, my kids come first. But for me, in order to model to my son, like what it is to be a parent and an artist, because my son has always been artsy since he was a kid and now he's a musician, he's amazing. It's all he wants to do and he does it well. Like I wanted to show him like, Lo, look, like sometimes you're gonna have to put yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I understand, like basically I, I was invited to go to a castle in Italy for a month and I was not gonna say no to that. I was like, <laughs> I'm going, <laughs> you know? He was like, that was the worst summer of my life. And I'm like, it was a month and you were okay. Like you survived. Um, exactly, exactly, you know? yeah. I feel like that was actually on my partner at the time um, who, I think we discussed this, like I was married for a while yeah. to someone who I would, I, it's nuts to think that I was married to him, but you know, he was responsible for my child at the time and he thought of my child as his child. So it's his fault really that the, <laughs> that month was bad for my son. I'm like, mm, yeah, you should blame him, not me, you know? <laughs> That's so funny. I, I look for figures like I look for like cultural figures and like actual people who embody sort of the maternal figure putting herself first. So like, I, I, I appreciate very much that like you assert that through love is an ex country. And like, I really appreciate those extreme examples. And I like, I was raised with one of them in, in the form of um, La Llorona. I don't know if you're familiar with her yeah. legend, but like the legend comes in so many different forms. People tend to put their own twist on it, especially like uh, regional twists. But in essence, for those who might not know, um, hers is a legend about a woman who according to legend, uh, murders her children and then um she's she's doomed um as a result of having committed the ultimate crime you know what I mean and so you can hear her wailing and she's looking for um surrogate children to steal and it's the story that's told to children in order to keep them close to home but when I was a kid and I heard that story I was like what's the big deal she just wanted some free time <laughs> like do you know what I mean and she did what she had to do and I then and I also like and then she was also supposed to be somebody we were frightened of but I was like well, if she's this demonic and she shows up outside of my house wailing, I'm going to go introduce myself to the bitch. Like, <laughs> like I'm not going to repel her. And so whenever figures like that, that emerge, like in literature, I'm always like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? One oh, of my yeah. first sort of evil crushes is like evoked. So, so, so I, was <laughs> I love that. First of all, I love that because it shows me that like you were fearless from day one, which is love. <laughs> and that you, like it also explains the 666 in all of your handles on social media. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, yes. But yeah, villains are like, women villains are like super fascinating. Oh. Like, I could read about them, watch them. Ursula, oh my God. Um, like also like the Wicked Witch, uh, obviously, um, What's her face? The one with the horns to Maleficent. Yeah, just all of those amazing yeah. women that were basically demonized. Oh, totally. Yeah. I always loved the villains and I always loved um, screen representations, especially like cartoon representations of those villains. And as a child, I wasn't, I didn't understand what the attraction was. And in retrospect, 
I, I understand that like what I was attracted to was, was, was their autonomy and their power. The other thing that I was attracted to was that the way that they looked was a closer approximation to my Mexican family <laughs> yes. Yes. and Cinderella. And so I was like, those witches, those witches look like my fucking Mexican family. That's who I want to be. You know what I mean? Yes. That, that's the representation of the group to which I belong. So yeah, I totally agree with this. Like, <laughs> wicked and evil women characters tend to tend to not subscribe to be- like Western beauty ideals. And mm-hmm. I think like I read somewhere, or it seems like so many of those old cartoons, like those women are based on women of color, or like and maybe anti-Semitic representations mm-hmm. of Jewish women, and like how how pervasive anti-Semitism was and still is. You know the ways that only specific types of Jewish women maybe are considered beautiful. Mm -hmm. Same with women of color, same with, you know, all of us who don't have um, the Western idealized, uh, you know, body type. So yeah, I love that. I love what you're saying. It's fucking dope. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) So, um, one of the coolest things to happen recently was Rush Limbaugh's death. I I was, when he died, I was like, (gasps) right? Like, I was so happy. I was like, oh, a moment of joy, a ray of sunlight, a gift. Finally. And, 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 and so many people took to social media to express their joy in the way that people express joy at the death of a despot or a tyrant or an abuser, because that's what he was, right? He was also a he did tyrant. He what? Did, he used to do that. He used to express joy mm-hmm. at the death of, of AIDS patients. So he would have these like cartoonish sounds, like ba-boing, like whenever mm-hmm. he would announce the, the, the names of dead men, dead gay men. So he can go fuck himself. Like he exactly. basically is inviting this, right? Like Yeah. Like, oh yeah. He devoted himself yeah. to spectacles of like homophobic cruelty. Like that that was that was his stock and trade. And so uh, when he died and people were expressing their joy online. Um, and, 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 um, and expressing it through the written word, of course, um, so many other folks emerged to like wag their fingers about speaking ill of the dead. Right. And, um, I of course thought of you and what you did to pave the way for us not to speak ill of the dead, but to speak truthfully about them, right? Yeah, because exactly. that's what you did. Absolutely. And that's what all of us who expressed that joy did. And so I was wondering if you could share a bit about your, you know, what, what, what you felt um, the day that Limbaugh died and um, also um, what you learned from, from that experience that you had speaking truthfully about the death of Barbara Bush. Yeah, and I go into it, I go into it in the book um, about like the circumstances and where I was. I was in Tunisia, I was having an amazing time. I was drunk. I had like brought these amazing edibles with me. I was so happy the night that night and I went to check and everyone was just saying that Barbara Bush was this like beautiful person and RIP and like literally like the only thing I could think of was her saying well a few things one when someone asked her well you know your son's about to invade Iraq and people are gonna die what are your thoughts on that and she said oh well why should I why should I bother my beautiful mind about something like that you know and by the way, she's, when she's saying that, you know, she's talking about Iraqi children and women and people. She's also talking about our troops, which I don't, I don't really care. I, I hate like empire, but she's also like talking shit yeah. about, you know, Americans also dying. Like she doesn't want to even think about it. Um, so to me, she spoke ill of the dead when she did that. She said mm-hmm. that they weren't even worthy 
of bothering mm-hmm. her mind, which she assumed was beautiful, even though it was so hateful. Yeah. So for me, it's just like, oh, I, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to, I'm going to do what she did, but mm-hmm. I didn't have the kind of power and status, right? Like this is a woman who, when she died, there were security, there were secret security by her coffin. Like that's how safe this bitch was, you know? And it like, even in death, she's safe. Mm -hmm. Um, So my experience, I think what I learned was to always, always um, hire people to make sure that all your private information is safe. That's really the, my, not the number one thing I learned. If you're going to be, if you're going to speak, if you're a person who's marginalized in any way and you speak publicly in a way that attaches your name to your, to your speech, then people are going to come after you and your family. And you just have to be prepared for that. You can't, we can wish for a better world, but it doesn't exist. So we can create ways to be safe. Um, And I think, I mean, I also learned that there are a lot of things that, there are a lot of laws that protect speech and people might not like it, but, you know, I, it would, it would have been illegal for them to fire me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I knew that when I tweeted, I'm never going to be fired. And people, I think, instead of being pissed at the fact that there is no job security in America, there is no actual you know, like academia is one of very few ways to have job security. Um, And even then you have to trade your soul. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, instead of being mad at that, they were just mad at me because that's what uh, white and conservative Americans do, right? They just blame people that are sort of at the bottom of the Mm -hmm. the ladder. Not that I am because I am light-skinned, but like people who are lower on the ladder get blamed for bullshit that people who are all the way at the top of the ladder are responsible for. So I think, you know, trying to sort of move my message so that we're all kind of unified around this, you Mm -hmm. know, Uh, when I went back to work and like there was this media and there were all these like evil right wingers who showed up and these Nazis, literally Nazis showed up, neo neo Nazis showed up to my job. I was looking at them and I was like, wow, these guys are just really sad that they don't have jobs. Yeah. You know, that they're, that they're like working at these radio stations that don't really pay them um, and they have no job security and they hate me for having, you know, my speech and my, so just realizing all of these things, I think the complications and the very sm- much smaller intricate notes to how, not that it matters how hate works in America, but I kind of, I want to understand. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And like, it's just nuts to me how disempowered someone who has a lot of privilege can feel. Like, can they even imagine being in our position? Right? They can't, Mm -hmm. like, it's impossible. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that that is a really baffling thing when somebody who occupies a position of like immense privilege um, uh, believes that they're being uh, victimized by the very people that they're standing on top of. <laughs> like yeah. that always just- Just seeing those cops last I, summer. I, I can't empathize with it. That's like something mm-hmm. I can't empathize with. I can like, I can understand it intellectually, right? but- yeah. I'm not going to like affectively yeah. try to occupy those shoes. I don't, I'm not interested in doing that. No, no, no. And we shouldn't have to. I mean, but the thing is like, we are trained to because of oh, the food that we consume. We are constantly being put in the shoes of, you know, a white man, a, a cis straight white man, um, sometimes also a cis gay white man who is, you know, feels oppressed and like what happens. I just, I just watched Cherry and I couldn't, I couldn't read the book cause I tried to read it. Um, but it's basically about a privileged white guy from Cleve from the outskirts of Cleveland who, you know, feels so oppressed that he ends up joining the army. Um, and then when he comes home becoming an addict and robbing banks and I mean, that's what the book, that's what the book is about. That's what the movie's about. The book came out 
the guy was in prison when he wrote the book. Like who the fuck goes to prison and is able to write a book? Right. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, other than amazing, like, like, you know, Angela Davis or amazing, like black activists, right? Like just the fact that he wrote it, he did it, he wrote it and then he was um, rewarded for it, right? Mm-hmm. Like in, you know, now he has all these opportunities. And to me, like that's so nutty. Like they don't need our empathy. They already, they're, they're gonna be okay. They have plenty of it, exactly, yeah. In Love is an Ex-Country, you include like um, you include a small sampling of some of the hate mail and the threats that you received in the wake of like the Barbara Bush tweets. And um, you give the number, which is 800 and some, right? You received like 800 and some hate messages. And um, and and recently um, there's been some uh, public discourse around the threats um, that women who are journalists, writers, and academics receive, and some like disingenuous debate um, regarding like uh, the validity of those threats. And I think what's missing in like much of the discourse is that whether or not a person is going to execute those threats isn't what makes the barrage horrifying. What makes it horrifying is the barrage of violence, psychological violence moving in your direction. And that was something that like, I was trying, that that became something that I tried to capture after um, I engaged in some criticism and then I got threats as well. I wanted for people to understand the volume because I think that that's one of, of the pieces that is misunderstood is that the content matters, but so does the volume that it's inescapable that when you open your mailbox and it literally like, I mean, it vomits hate on you and that's the point impacts your well-being right yes and that's like the point that they're trying to make too it's a it's so many of these attacks are coordinated Mm -hmm. Um, I I learned actually like more things I learned I learned so much about how like well mobilized um hate is and how well mobilized the right and even people who probably don't even consider themselves right-wingers like there were people who are probably think of themselves as liberals or Democrats who are also like, shame on you, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Just the way that hate is mobilized and the way that people go on these different threads and different websites and different forums and are told like, this bitch did this thing, go fuck with her now. And people Mm -hmm. do, like they just, they're just like, it's it's an army. It is, it's very military, the way that it works. Yeah, they're given marching orders. Exactly, and like for us, like, one of the things like I'm trying to do with this book is talk about love and maybe imagine what would a mobilization of love look like mm-hmm. and why isn't it as powerful? Why don't we have, I mean, we try, I, I feel like the last year, especially we've been mobilizing so much more around mutual aid and black lives matter. And now this like horrifying, disgusting wave of Asian hate against Asian Americans. Um, so, I feel like we, I want us to wake up in the morning and be like, I fucking love you so much. (laughs) Yo, you don't understand. I fucking love you. Like we need to be bombarding people on the mornings with love and being like, no, what you're saying is important. What you're doing is important. Like we love you. We love you. You are loved. You are important. You are cherished. Um, And I, I mean, I try to do that as much as I can. Um, Yeah. But yeah, the, and the point is to mess you up psychologically and oh, to totally. your speech so that you don't speak anymore, so that you're afraid of that barrage. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think they realize like, no, <laughs> like bitches like us are not going to be afraid, you know, like I. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that we're, we're not afraid of La Llorona, you know, <laughs> and, and and when something that we say or do triggers that sort of response 
we understand that we're moving in the right direction. Like yeah. they just indicated to us that we did the right thing, that we're saying something that ought to have been said. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And so instead of, instead of feeling disciplined, it's a grotesque form of validation. Yes. Or yes. a perverse form of validation, I should That's say. True. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like, um, let me just gather like one more thing that I noticed about it is um, I remember like watching this interview with Shirley Chisholm mm -hmm. where she talks about how like someone asked her like aren't you afraid you're getting all these death threats aren't you afraid she's like no people who are catalysts in society you, you have to know that you're going to take hits mm -hmm. like you're a catalyst so you're moving us in a certain direction and there's going to be a lot of resistance mm -hmm. right and then there's this idea that came out a, few, a couple of years ago I don't remember the op-ed but someone saying no actually the resistance are those on the right are those who don't want universal health care who don't want for us to take care of each other as humans on this planet, that's actually the resistance. Not, we're not the resistance. We're actually like smart people who are moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And the resistance is like wanting us to stop so that the positions of power can stay where they are, right? Yeah. So it's a combination the of- The resistance are conservatives. They want right. things to remain as they are. Like the status quo is something that they don't want to see shifted at all so yeah so I understand I think of this stuff as like like it's almost like chemical right like you do you say something it's a catalyst it moves stuff and then there's going to be these like crackles people are going to be pissed people are going to be and that's just part of the science of it like you, mm -hmm. you you expect it you safeguard yourself and your family and people you love um you know you get weapons and <laughs> And yeah, which is another thing, like when people were like, oh, I bet you also hate guns. I'm like, no, bitch, like <laughs> I hate guns in general, but that doesn't mean that I don't know how to shoot one and that I won't fuck right. someone if they show up in my at my house, you know, like, right? yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I think that like, yeah, I, I don't, I think that they, they have this idea of us that we're not, that we're like pacifists when <laughs> really what we're doing is like, no, actually, no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Whenever people have the impression that, that I'm a pacifist who doesn't like to eat meat, I'm like, where the fuck did that come from? Yeah, like, yeah. And I, I love that about Mona, Mona Tahawi, like, Oh God. Yeah. Punching, punching a man at a bar who, who groped her, like just being like, no, I'm done. Like, yes. You know, and that's incredible. I love that story. And during my last year of instruction, before I got removed from my classroom, um, I told my students Mona's story about fighting back against a, a, somebody who assaulted her. And I folded that story into a lesson that I was doing on the nervous system because we were talking about trauma experiences and oh fight, God. flight, freeze responses. And uh, we discussed trauma and its impacts and, and, and the lecture got really heavy and there was like this gravitas in the room, especially among like, you know, my, my female students. And then I said, you have permission to use violence. I give it to you. And you have permission to use violence to defend yourself. And I want to tell you the story of a woman in her fifties who used violence to beat the shit out of somebody. And the girls were all, yes. And like, just the effervescence in the room that day um, was incredible. Like those students were so hungry for that validation and for that permission. And they even sat differently in their seats after hearing that story. Like their shoulders were unburdened after like, being told that they had permission to defend their bodies. And what a, what a loss it is that you're not in the classroom. Like, honestly, like I would, if, if like I was in charge, I'd be like, Miriam is giving, you know, a semester long course for every teacher in America 
on like how to teach. Like this is, it's ridiculous. The ways <laughs> that, the, the, the twisted ways that public school works, right? Like where so much money is going to policing. Yeah. Students, faculty, all of that to administration, which in turn polices yeah. forces ideas of propriety, you know, on good teachers. Yeah. You know? It um, privileges conformity and mediocrity. Yeah. And if you conform and you remain mediocre, you rise to the top and you are exactly. tolerated. Exactly. And it's really horrifying to watch. And there are a lot of good teachers. There are also a lot of super shitty teachers. There are a handful of good administrators. Most of them eat shit though. Yeah, they do. <laughs> like, yeah. Just- and there's a handful of predatory, awful teachers too. You oh, know? yes. I mean, the, the week or the month that I was being attacked specifically in Fresno, which I had to leave because it was so bad. Mm-hmm. That particular month, two different teachers got caught um, molesting their students. And yep. you didn't hear about it on the news because nobody cares. They're like, oh yeah. But that's actually, the, those are people who should be shamed and yeah. you know, treated like shit and scared for their lives when they open their laptop, right? They should be like, oh my God, you know? But no. Yeah. The, the, district, the district that I worked for, um, I had two teachers um, identified this year for uh, sexual harm. One teacher, while he was instructing through Zoom, had his split screen open and was showing underage pornography. And um, like you could l- see in the search bar that, and he was teaching high school that he had looked up something to the effect of high school porn. And he's, he's, in, in, and this is on during instructional time and kids are like taking photos of the screen. Do you know what I mean? In order to like share with people like, holy shit, this is happening during class. And then on, at another school, uh, at a different school site, a teacher was arrested because he uh, met with a 15 year old girl in a park for yeah. the purpose of statutory rape. That's ridiculous. You know? Yeah. And like now that we're having this conversation, like the, our culture is having this bigger conversation around abolition, you know, taking s- stuff from, you know, the work of Patrice Cullors and other Black Lives Matter activists and saying, okay, what can we do? What will we do about predators in the absence of police? As if police aren't predators. Right. <laughs> right. So like, so like, I love that you told those students, like you can, Mm-hmm. use violence to defend yourself because imagine if they had just gotten that lecture and that that teacher was in front of them like mm-hmm. like as a Palestinian I'm like rocks got well rocks would have gotten thrown you know like, <laughs> um, yeah and I like that's to me like a conversation that I'm really excited that we're having that like we're starting to imagine what mm-hmm. the world can look like without you know education the way we see it, policing the uh, policing in general, the prison industrial system, all of these fucked up ways that, you know, and just now, like the fact that a bunch of us got these $1,400 deposits in our bank, like, why don't we have UBI? Why don't, why, exactly. why can't we take care of it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah like- I was binge watching 16 and Pregnant the other day. <laughs> yeah. And like, as I was watching it, I just kept thinking to myself, this series underscores every reason why we need UBI and universal health care in the United States. Like every social problem that is represented by this reality show could be treated if we handed people the money that they need to survive and we gave people the services that they need to thrive. Exactly. And withhold yeah. them for what purpose? In order to perpetuate the patriarchal nuclear family. The end. Exactly. And also to sort of like, always what's discussed is like, oh, well, you know, um, I'm, I'm noticing this with Democrats or liberals as they'll say stuff like, well, we need to give those young women uh, the resources to understand their, you know, reproductive system. We need reproductive rights. And we do, we do need reproductive rights. 
But as someone who was 18 and chose, like I chose to have my baby, you know, like we also have to understand that like people do have bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. And when a woman chooses to have a child, even if there was reproductive, reproductive co co coercion at some point, when you say, okay, I'm going to do this, you need all the support. You need exactly. the support of society behind you because you need it. Mm -hmm. it doesn't, if it doesn't exist, you're fucked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my utopian dreams is that no child should have to rely on their biological family of origin to thrive on this fucking planet. Yeah. I mean, they didn't used to, right? We used yeah. to live in like communities and not, you know, just have our mom and our dad or like maybe one auntie. Um, mm -hmm. Are you yeah. an auntie, by the way? Am I an auntie? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Is this great? It's the best. I feel like I was born to be an auntie. Like I was Because <laughs> I was... I'm never going to be a mother. And like, and like, and like, you know, like sometimes like out of endearment, people will call me mom or, the, or, 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 you know, mother or whatever. And I'm just like, no, like I've always wanted to be the eccentric bitchy aunt with the smoker's voice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So everybody's a little bit afraid of because they don't know what she's going to say. Like, yeah. I feel like that, that, that's my destiny. I have an auntie destiny. I love it. I'm <laughs> so excited. Like, yeah. I mean, the world is, is richer for it. Right. Like, I, exactly. I, I, um, going back to one of the, one of the statements you made earlier about love and wanting to, um, wanting to barrage people with love as opposed to, the um the hatred and i uh, the violence that that we described earlier when we talked about um responses to to our work i was thinking about and i'm i'm interested in what you have to say about um misperceptions misrepresentations and misunderstandings of love for example I think of criticism and I conceive of criticism as an act of generosity. And I think that sometimes that gift is wrapped in thorns, but it's still a gift. And I think that people conflate softness with love, but sometimes love is really sharp. And I'm curious about how you conceive of care and of love because i i think that your book is um an act of care and as you were mentioning earlier it is a journey of forgiveness so can you comment on yeah i love this love care? okay yeah i think like so much of the book too is kind of figuring out the ways that I was misinformed about love. Like, mm -hmm. and not just me, we're all misinformed about love at different stages of our life. So because I'd grown up with an abusive father, right? I thought that that was love. I thought yeah. that love included abuse, right? Or that love includes, um, you know, violence. Yes. So when you, once I understand, okay, if love isn't that, then, and it is care, like what are some other ways that I've thought of um, or that I've been taught that love is? So I'm actually like more, for me, it's like a constant question. I don't have an answer. I don't know. I still like don't know, okay, what is love? Love, all I know is that it feels good in the body. Yes. You know, it, it, it feels, it doesn't frighten me. Um, and criticism, yes, criticism can be love, but I get to choose that source mm -hmm. so having like a critic who doesn't understand where I'm coming from or doesn't understand whatever critiquing my work that to me doesn't feel like love it's not helpful but having someone from my community or a peer or someone who wants to challenge me to do better having that come come in feels like love so just constantly kind of having a sense of inquiry and like wanting to learn more about what love will look like is 
the, is more interesting to me than like kind of pinpointing um, what love is, you know? Mm -hmm. But also like one of the things for this book was realizing that as a Palestinian, losing my homeland was and is a constant ache mm -hmm. um, and that I feel like love is there. Like my, the love that I want is in that kind of absent place, the place that I can't go to, the place that I can't go back to. Um, mm -hmm. And so constantly building home, you know, in my body and in my communities and surrounding me, like to me, that's what love and care is. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, so, so when, as you were writing Love is the Next Country, you were, um, well, I'm curious if you were writing while you were in the process of attempting to reconcile and repair um, your relationship with your father. And I was wondering if like writing itself and literature itself structured that process or if that process took place prior and then became something that you brought art to. Like, was there, was there a synergy between the two? That's such a good question because like, yeah, it is very chicken and egg, right? Like what mm -hmm. is, but I think it's, no, I don't think there was like a starting point. I think that, and I say, I talk about this in the book, how like my dad is the one who really wanted me to be a writer. Like he really, mm -hmm. really supported it, you yeah. know? And I know a lot of people, um, you know, from did especially he want Brown. To be a specific type of writer? Did he want you to be a novelist or? Yeah, yeah. He wanted me to be okay. a poet or a novelist yeah. or a screenwriter, just anything that's like, um, that would like kind of lift up our community, lift yeah. up our stories, right? Yeah. So, and I've talked to other Brown folks who are like, oh my God, my parents were so not supportive of my art. So yeah. I feel really grateful for that. Yeah. So to me, it makes sense that I would use writing to like find my way back to my dad, find my way mm -hmm. back to forgiveness. And like, forgiveness doesn't mean, oh, I have no boundaries. No, yeah. forgiveness means, seeing that he's changed mm -hmm. and then when when he behaves in ways that mimic the old ways correcting that and being like no this is a boundary for me you can't yeah you know it's it's not that it's conditional is that um it has it, he has to also bring something to the table which is mm -hmm. kindness and love right mm -hmm. so but yeah when i first started writing the book i wasn't talking to had not spoken to my dad like i didn't speak to him for seven years Mm -hmm. And in the process of writing it, I went back to him to speak to him. Um, and I chronicled all of that. And I'm glad, I'm glad that I took notes on that road trip and in general, um, when I was thinking of returning to, you know, my, the house that my parents live in and kind of being at peace with that chapter being over. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I um I I rarely read descriptions of like abuse taking place in households and um and representations of domestic violence that are um precise enough that they like reflect spaces that I've been in and reflect realities that I've experienced. Yeah, and yours did. Thanks. Like, I, I, I was like, I felt a sense of solidarity with you because of what you've experienced. Um, and the example that you set through the work that you did in reconciling with your father um, pushes me to rethink certain relationships that I have had with, um, with, with folks who have committed harm. And I think that like, um, 
what you what you've accomplished in terms of 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 literature is important um and that you also set a social example and i'm always like seeking out those models that i can follow and 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 examples that i can use to better my relations with others so i hope that that folks who are um, considering reconciliation and devoted to reconciliation, especially with somebody who's done that type of harm, I hope that they they find their way to love as a next country because it inspires in that way. Me too, and thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, Amanda says we are at time. Yes. I, I was like, that's a perfect place to close, I think. Okay. Can I just say, I fucking love you guys so much. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Um, I'm wondering if you could both speak to, you know, obviously the world is a dangerous place and you've both been in very dangerous situations, relationships. Um, and I'm wondering how, what are the steps that you've taken to protect yourselves? Like, what are you doing and like, what could you tell other women who are writing through this kind of situation, how they can also do so? Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, there are a lot of privacy um, organizations and companies that will protect your data online. So I would definitely look into those. I think a, a quick Google chat will, or a quick Google search will, will help you find that. Um, so putting that into place is key. So like whatever you're being paid for a project, set aside yeah. an amount to do that. Um, I also have pepper spray like constantly on me when I leave the house. I think tasers are generally easy to find and to purchase. Um, also boundaries, just having really strong boundaries because you want to protect your time too. Um, understanding whether or not you need trigger warnings, things like this, just ways that you can move in the world safely. Um, yeah, that's my suggestion. Yeah, to that, I would add that like, and this isn't necessarily like in, in regards to like abuse or domestic violence, but this is more in regards to I'm um, trying to initiate activism or change in a place that is very conservative and therefore resistant, um, it can't be done alone. It always has to be done in community and in concert with others. And like, I would advise people who are interested in enacting change and transforming um, circles in which they live and move to always find as many other people as they can in order to, um, to work together. If you attempt that alone, not only do you have nobody to hold you accountable and you need to be held accountable, mm -hmm. you also become an incredibly easy target to right. destroy or move. So, always seek out um, allies and comrades in, in whatever community you're seeking to change. Great, that's awesome, thank you. Okay, so we have one coming through from the chat from Lisa. Lisa, I'm gonna mangle your last name, Krozik. Love that you talked about going to therapy in this book. Did therapy help you construct the memories? Boundaries are so important and I'm so glad you're talking about this. Amazing, um, therapy helps me construct everything like it just and in the book I talk about how my therapist it was like the first time I'd had a therapist who was a woman of color she was Latina and indigenous and she was just like really the most important person in my life those years because she she did keep me accountable and she did she worked in ways that were so um she, she wasn't like your typical therapist. She had a lot of uh, children's play techniques. So that helped me access my childhood memories, but also because 
I'd written my first novel, which is semi-autobiographical at such a young age, I had captured and put in notes like so many memories um, of mine from childhood. So accessing those notes um, was really important too. So it was like, it's, it's, it's a combination of therapy and um, just keeping an account. So having an account of things that happened and being open to changing that account or like looking at it from a different lens. Um, and I think therapy, like the, the main thing that helped was understanding that I am where I am now, that I'm not in that space anymore, that that was in the past and the ways that I can, um, you know, support the self I have now and let go of a lot of the trauma responses that I had. You know, I used to just use things that helped me when I was trapped those first 20 years that don't, now that I'm in my early forties, I don't need those kinds of, I don't need to stare into space for three hours and like figure right. out how to leave a building, you know? I mean, I do it sometimes anyway, but like, <laughs> you know, I don't need to do that. So yeah, stuff like that. Miriam, do you want to speak to that one too? About therapy? I'm about memories, constructing memories. About constructing there. memories. Um so I um so I I wrote a memoir that um that required me to explore um trauma memories. Um and when I wrote that memoir, I did have a therapist and I was in therapy. Um, I didn't particularly like my therapist. Um, and so right. the, the experience in that instance um, wasn't helpful. Um, like Renda, I now have um, a therapist who's a woman of color. And um, she's um, the first uh, woman of color, queer woman of color therapist that I've ever worked with. And um, and working with her has been life-changing. Like absolutely okay. life-changing. So um, I, I would absolutely um, recommend that for like, any ethnically or racially minoritized woman like to find somebody yeah. like that someone who understands what you don't have to explain yes to someone who's in the right. center how things on the margin right. affect you basically yeah right exactly and was it was it a difficult search like were because I, I i feel like what were you cycling through therapists until you found a, a woman of color that that you could work with in my case a friend recommended um, my therapist and, um, we clicked immediately and, and so I was really fortunate because she came via recommendation. Um, and then right. therapists that I had had prior, um, were like folks that I chose from a list that was given to me by the right. insurance company. And so, my my pool was really limited and then um when i was really young it would be sliding scale therapists and right. and and so i had sliding scale adventures <laughs> you right. know Me too. So. Yes. <laughs> totally been there also yes yeah, lots of old white men like literally taking naps while i was talking <laughs> oh yeah i i yeah it is nothing is more disheartening and wounding than when your therapist starts to snore and you're just like is this motherfucker snoring should I draw penises on their face like what should I do they're asleep <laughs> <laughs> you know like yeah it's fucking yeah but it is something to watch a therapist fucking fall asleep oh my god yeah yeah 
we so we have Kelly has a question that she wants to ask and she wants to come back on screen, but I want to actually make sure we have everyone. Does anyone else in the chat have a question so that when we bring Kelly back, she can stay back and sing us a song? Yeah. Um, which we would love to close out. Um I don't see it. I have one. I have one, and then we'll bring Kelly back. Does that sound good? Yeah. See if I so, so I'm curious about um, the all access of the virtual space. So traditionally you'd have this book tour and you would go to an event and you would talk about whatever you talk about and it stays in that room. Like sure, there'll be, might be a video and someone might, might take some photos and, and like, how does it feel for both of you to be so available vulnerable, like open to surveillance? Like how, how has it been this past year to make that shift? And how are you taking care of yourselves? I personally, like, I, I really like this because okay. I get to stay in my home, you know, like before right. the pandemic, <laughs> I was on, you know, flights like at least once right. a month I was on a, a fucking airplane which is you know it's it, being on an airplane is like all the intersections of my identity align like I'm fat right. I'm I'm Arab I'm Muslim I'm a woman and people behave really badly on air on, right. on air, and in airports like when especially masculine people who don't feel the need to you know behave um right. Yeah. So that was always not fun and, and very painful uh, to be in like right. the economy seats. Um, yeah. But I mean, in terms of availability, I think that's, that's also on me. Like I can, I have this, this is my screensaver. I don't know if you can see it, but it says, the kitty. Um, it's really hard, but it says, say, it says, say no. Okay. Mm, no. Yeah. No. Right. You know, like, like just say no more and only say yes when you are really sure you can take something on. And I think that right. having that rule has been really good for me during this time because people, you know, when you're, when you're a writer and you've had books out, people think that they can email you a novel and be like, Hey, let yep. me know what you think. Or yeah. that you've never talked to will ask you for a letter of recommendation or an introduction yeah. or something. And you kind of want to pick and choose like, okay, is this person in my community? Does this person need this? Am I available right, right now to give this? And then go from there. Right. Mm -hmm. God, the letter of recommendation. It's the bane of my existence. <laughs> <sighs> what do you got, Miriam? Um, I, I do appreciate, um, being able to participate in events in these sorts of digital spaces. Um, I like this does enhance access and I very much appreciate the enhanced access and I hope that it continues um, yeah. because requiring us to meet IRL in brick and mortar spaces is is classist, it's so incredibly expensive to have to do right. so much traveling and it's also incredibly ableist. Um, and so I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate this, the, the shift that's largely happened into digital space. Um, and sometimes I do feel a little overwhelmed by, um, people's ability to access me. Um, right. like when I was saying um, a person who is a, a, a stranger um, might ask for a favor that's really time consuming or labor intensive. Um, and that's difficult and strange. Um, and I also, sometimes find it hard to navigate when um, strangers will contact me to share their traumas with me. Right. Um, that can sometimes be difficult to hold. And if I have the capacity to do so, I will. 
But like Rhonda was saying, when I understand that I have to say no for the sake of my health, then I need to assert that boundary and say no. And so I'm, I, the word no is, 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 yeah. is a word that I've, I've, I've been trying to uh, embrace more. Great. It's all about boundaries. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to say thank you again. I love you both. This is the best conversation. I, I LOL several times. Um, I just want to remind everyone that, um, book soup is our bookseller for these events. So dare has been dropping the link to the books into the chat. So please purchase either from book soup or your local brick and mortar. I know that I went down to page against the machine earlier today and made my orders. Cause that's my local bookstore. Hey. Um, also, yeah. if, if you are able to go in person, book soup has a bunch of my books signed. So if you if you want to, oh, that's sign exciting. Yes. Yeah. Go get and a signed be, copy. Maybe you can also call them and okay. have them send you the signed copy. Yeah. I'm sure that's probably definitely possible. Uh, I just need to say that WeHo Reads is a celebrated literary series presenting new and no noteworthy authors of interest to the West Hollywood community. WeHo Reads is presented by the City of West Hollywood's Art Division. For more details on full program and events coming up, please visit weho.org backslash WeHo Reads. So I'm going to thank everyone for joining us. Thank these incredible writers. Kelly's going to come back on screen and she's going to ask a question of you two and then she's going to close us out with a song. All right. Thank Kelly, you. Do you need me to help you? Of course. There she is. All right. I'm out. Thank you so much, you guys. That was so thought provoking and entertaining and interesting. And I feel really inspired. Um, my question, Rhonda, is your theme of forgiveness. Like what comes after forgiveness when you're not writing from a place of pain or trauma and you feel content and happy? Sometimes for me, it just feels like forgiveness purgatory. Like I'm uninspired. I can't pull from anything because I'm just cool. Like life's good. So what's for you after this? And like, how do you continue to write when, you know, you found some peace and, and some solace in your memoirs? I love that. Um, well, fortunately, I'm still a human being. So I'm constantly unhappy. <laughs> um, you know, like there's no real, I mean, forgiveness is a way to give yourself peace for sure. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that that trauma just goes away or any of that. But like, in terms of like writing from a place of joy or happiness, you're onto something. Cause I mean, one of my favorite quotes is by Borges. And he says that, you know, literature and art is the transformation of pain, right? You transform pain and you, and you make it into art, but happiness is its own end. There's nothing you need to transform happiness into. It's there and it works. So I think that it's all uh, like, I feel like we're always gonna have stuff to write about because the world we live in is not aligned. It's got, there's so much out of whack. There's so much bullshit happening constantly. People are constantly in pain. And so I think to stand witness, right, is a big part of making art and also to sort of agitate and to, and to try to get people to see the ways that, you know, um, a sense of like complacency, right, is dangerous mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it assumes that everyone is safe when no one is safe, no one is safe ever. So um, yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. That did, that was helpful. Thank awesome. you. Awesome, yay. Great that. Thank you guys. <laughs> and I guess that's me, my turn to perform a song. Um, this song is titled Hope Rising, and it is about identity and discovering yourself and, and knowing that the journey is as ugly as it is, it is also beautiful because um, there's beauty in everything, even in the pain. So this song is titled Hope Rising, and I dedicate this to anyone on that journey of self. my what happened to my life the pieces are falling around me 
Searching for the roots that are buried deep below The fruits that have fallen from me The bigots came and shook me down They beat me up, they took me for everything I had But that's alright, I've got earth on my side At least my roots are still intact I've got hope rising I've got hope rising It's been unfair and the worst been done And you're left feeling like you're the only one No, I know No, I know But I believe in a creator Who created all this magic that exists around us If you choose to see it, see it in the wings of a bird And the purple mountains and the purple mountains Oh, I have got home Rising. This is a tale of indigenous resilience and I resist your opposition of our existence and your appropriation, misinformation, true native style. I'm just working with what I'm given. You may have removed this wolf from the pack, but this wolf still bites back as long as my feet are rooted to this earth. My hope is like the trees I've got hope rising I've got hope rising I've got hope rising I've got hope rising Thank you guys. Thank you so much for we hope for having me. Thank you, Rhonda and Miriam, for sharing your hearts with us today. I'm super grateful to have been a part of this and to join in on this amazing dialogue. I feel really inspired. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Kelly.